Goblins and welcome back to Bride of Alternate Ending. I'm Brennan Klein and I'm going to let my co-host introduce himself. Who the hell are you? I am Tim Brayton. I am the uh, the alternate ending uh, what it, critic in residence. Is that what we call me or is it chief critic? I'm suddenly drawing a blank. It's, it's critic in residence. Chris, critic in residence. Yes, that is what I am. Yes, and I, bl- I, I briefly flirted with being the TV critic in residence, but that podcast doesn't exist anymore, so you know? I'm still, I'm finding my identity still. You, you, are, you are carving out a niche as our uh, direct-to-streaming rom-com and Christmas movie critic in residence. That is true, and I'm happy to. I'm happy to be it. Yeah, I'm. I'm basically the the gremlin in the closet of alternate ending. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, so sorry that this episode is late. Literally the night before we were supposed to record, um, I completely lost my voice, um, which does make it more difficult to record a podcast. <laughs> um, I did get tested twice. It's in no way COVID related. It's just related to my weird body. Okay. Well. Well, as long as I'm not going to catch uh, COVID over over the internet, that's all I, I'm worried about. Yeah, that's the only thing that really matters um, about yes. my health, obviously. It, um, yeah, is is my my health? So mm-hmm. no, that's that's exactly perfect. Uh, yeah, no. So I my voice is mostly back. Um, every now and then it gets tired of my shit. Still, I'm still recovering, but I can record a podcast. So we're here to talk about the the long-awaited um, episode from patron Carl Beasley. He wanted us to talk about terrors of the deep and y'all voted for leviathan 1989 for some reason <laughs> yeah yeah y'all sure did so, so that was that was swell of you thank you yeah um i mean we 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 kind of went away from our typical structure for assigning nominees because there were so many deep sea terror films that came out in the immediate you know, beforehand and in the wake of the abyss, that I, all of I our... would, hmm? I would be inclined to call it a cycle of abyss exploitation films. But absolutely, yeah. Um, but yeah, so all of them we picked from that very narrow band because those were the ones that seemed most uh, most in keeping with the the theme of the month, and also just it it wouldn't make sense to have like four from nineteen eighty nine and then one from like twenty twelve. Right. Um, I I was thinking about doing a bit where we started talking about Leviathan, and I was confused because I thought we were talking about the 2012 uh, documentary by the Harvard's Sensory Ethnographic Lab, uh, which is about a fishing boat. This is but not not about a fishing boat. <laughs> it is. I wish it was about a fishing boat because I like that documentary a whole hell of a lot. I think it's a, a real great picture, and you should all go see it. I'm less high on the uh, 2014, I believe, best foreign film nominee, Leviathan, but also a good picture. Uh, and what about this one? What about is where does where does Leviathan 1989 rank in the I, Leviathans? I will I will say this with unbridled confidence. I don't like it less than 1989's Deep Star. Six is that what it's called? Yeah, that's the Sean yeah. Cunningham one, which was yeah, also I, on the list. Which was also on the list because they're they're basically they're basically the same movie, and I think this one has a better cast. That's true. It is packed with name actors for straight white men. Um, like you know, here here's a Richard Crenna. Yep. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, yes, we're talking about Leviathan 1989, uh, directed by George P. Cosmatos, who you might know from Cobra or Rambo First Blood Part Two, or on the, on the subject of, of things for straight white men. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is very much a movie that was not designed with my demographic in mind and it didn't hit me. So, you know, good work. (laughs) Um, but yeah, George P. Cosmatos is also the father of uh, Panos Cosmatos, who recently directed Mandy, another film I actually don't like that much, although it's significantly better than Leviathan in every way possible. Yeah, I, I am actually very 
into the Panos Cosmetos, Cosmetos experience between uh, Mandy and um, Beyond the Black Rainbow. I, I think he's he's a okay in my books. Yes. See, well, that that's uh, the those films are ones that I can look at and say these are very good, but not for me. Mm-hmm. And whereas, I mean, this is my first uh, toe in the water of George Cosmatos, but if 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 they're uh, all like this, they're just not particularly good. Is the thing. We'll we'll surely get into this, but since since we've gone down this path, let's let's keep walking down it. Uh, I have seen several other George P. Cosmatos films. I. I would say this is an unimpressive film, even by his standards. Okay, that, and I well, feel that's good that for him. yeah, I feel that he is a good director of action, or at least a a a workmanlike director of action and a workmanlike director of of thrillers. Mm-hmm. I don't think he is a good director of horror, and this film eventually calls upon him to be a good director of horror. Yes, that is not something that I found to be the case either. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll try to tackle, well, you know, I'm going to try to do some of the plot synopsis of Leviathan, but, um, with the caveat I, that, oh, yes, I, I can do it for you very easily. Okay. If, if, so the thing in Alien had a baby. Yes, that's, <laughs> and it's underwater. <laughs> that, that, and it's, oh, of course. Thank you for, for correcting me. Very, very crucial element of my plot synopsis. It was a water birth. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, that that's pretty much it. Um, I will say I, I watched this film right before we were supposed to record the first time, so some of the details are going to be a little fuzzy. But I think you watched it even less recently than me, right? Oh, no, I, I re-watched it. I had planned on watching it the morning before we were going to record, and you canceled the night before we were going to record, if I recall correctly. Yeah, in, uh, in the middle so, of the night at like 3 a.m. because I yes. couldn't sleep. That's right. I woke up to your text. Uh, no, so I ended up rewatching this uh, just the day before of our of our recording. So oh, okay, great. So it's, you, you it's, can... it's good and clean and fresh. Yes. I'm I'm sorry because I saw on your letterbox that you had watched it for some reason during the pandemic I, as well. It was pre pre pandemic. I was um I did a little marathon of these abysploitation films. Very little. Uh, when the Kristen Stewart vehicle underwater opened. Oh. Uh, which was one of our our last pre pandemic films in in January of 2020. Yes, directed by William Eubank, who made a very bad new Paranormal Activity movie that's out now. <laughs> I I have resisted the siren call thus far of the new Paranormal Activity. But it I is. Get there soon. It, ooh, I I I really can't wait. Um, it's. I would say worse than the ghost dimension, which I didn't think I would say about anything. Hmm. Um, but we'll I'm see excited. how it goes for you. Uh, yeah, you can fill in any gaps in my Leviathan synopsis, although I don't. It's not really that complicated. Um, there is a Tri Oceanic Mining Corporation facility deep under the surface of the ocean. They're mining for silver. They're on day eighty-seven of ninety. So what could go wrong? Um. Basically, a variety of stupid things happen, mostly the fault of Daniel Stern, whose name is Sixpack and is about as uh, uh, wonderful of a character as that name might imply. 80s comic relief douchebags are one of my least favorite genre of comic relief. And even by that standards, I find him to be a particularly grating example of the form. Oh, yeah. He is, he is odious. He is very... He, he, he is... A pressurized rape culture torpedo um, that just blows the whole of this movie. Um, but yeah, so he's terrible. Um, he and ends up he and um, the, uh, w- the 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 main woman, right? I don't remember her name. Um, um, she is the main woman. I don't remember her name either. I think that's. Uh. That that speaks to how well she's characterized. She runs around a lot. It speaks, she, it speaks to to her level of characterization and the the quality of the acting. That when I think of who are the women in Leviathan, my first thought goes to the one that we only ever see on a TV monitor until the last scene of the film. Oh yeah, well she's got yeah. Meg Foster has something interesting going on about her that nobody else really does in this movie. I mean, I mean, Meg Foster has something interesting going on about her, which which is already. 
enough to put her head and shoulders above most of the members of this cast, just on paper, let alone in practice. Oh, dear Lord. But yeah, so uh, a woman with a capital W and six pack go into, or they discover the wreckage of a sunken Russian submarine called, well, alternately Leviathan or Leviathan, depending on who is reading the script at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and essentially they discover that the entire crew is dead. They as- assess that the submarine has been sunk by its own, uh, you know, n- nation, um, for some purpose. And they quickly realize that it's because there's this kind of biological fish, the thing monster situation. I, I was going to say, you could say there's, there's some kind of thing on the submarine and mm-hmm. you would be. It is it is shocking to me, given how clearly the whole thing is an alien clone, it is shocking to me how precisely it feels like a remake of the thing in the first like forty minutes or so of its running time. Yeah, it's really bizarre. And I mean like it, it just it really grafts the isolated disease monster thriller of the thing onto the kind of uh blue collar board workers like stuck together also isolated of alien mm-hmm. and it just it really just runs with both of those absolutely and and like the thing it uh it has no female characters yeah or at least th- there there are female bodies which the thing doesn't have <laughs> uh, it was, that was that was my joke yeah it, no, has, it okay. has female bodies yeah. to be fair i'm not entirely clear that it has male characters either so it's it's a sort of just it's a garbage shit show of characterization in general. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. So. Ah. Uh, okay. Um. So so. Long story short, Daniel's Daniel Stern gets uh gets infected, with he does die pretty quickly, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah. They 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 have the good sense to have him be the first victim, if I recall correctly. Uh. Yeah. It's him and then Lisa Eilbacher, I think. Right. Um, but yeah, so basically the captain of the ship or the manager of this team or whatever his job is, um, he is Stephen Beck played by Peter Weller and, uh, Tim. Yes. Is Peter Weller a good actor in other things? Cause I've I, seen RoboCop, but, but I was a kid. Well, I mean the thing, the trick about RoboCop is it's a very weird performance, but I think he does it well. I, I am a pro Peter Weller I like him. I like him as a screen presence. I I want him to get good meaty roles, even in grown, crummy genre, uh, genre films. So, so he is one of the people that on paper I'm like, yes, give me this. I want to see Peter Weller as the like hard okay. scrabble, sad sack leader of this this team of of working class dipshits. Okay, that's good to know because this is actually my first um, encounter with Peter Weller as an adult film watcher, and I was unimpressed. Um, he he performs this film about the same way that a slab of granite would perform the film, um, and really, I mean, I, I I did like one scene of his, which is that um, basically you see him like getting up to give this speech to kind of take charge of everyone, and then it has this kind of smash cut that reveals that he's actually back in his room and performing the speech in front of a mirror to practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really liked that element. But other than that, the only thing I really noted about his character is that his haircut kind of, it clearly aspires to be a mullet one day, (laughs) but it's just not quite anything. Yeah, no, it's, it's a real, real eighties hair going on. Um, I think I'm a little bit more, I don't want to say pro because this is, this is easily the worst Peter Weller performance I've seen. Um, I, I am not as hostile towards it as I, I think you are, and, and partially that might just be I am sympathetic to the actor. But I, I do think even even by given the fact that he's doing nothing at all with the role, many of the cast are doing less than nothing, so that at least makes him feel vaguely like a presence to yeah. me. Yeah. That's true, and and it is it is a cast of like generally recognizable actors doing less than nothing, including Hector Elizondo and Ernie Hudson, or two that we haven't mentioned yet. Like there's there's a lot of people, there's a lot of talented people making this movie, including Jerry Goldsmith um, on the score and Stan Winston doing the creature effects. Mm-hmm. Um, 
who here do you think does the best job overall, like, just, like, cast or crew? Um, I I think that the only candidates for that title are Jerry Goldsmith and Meg Foster. Honestly. Okay, not even, not even old Stan Winston over there? I mean, to be fair to Stan Winston, and here's where we get into that George Cosmatos doesn't know how to direct horror, uh, the monster is being very misserved by how this film presents it. Uh, it appears in far too much direct lighting. Mm, that's like, that's it, very it, true. It hasn't been lit right. And this is just the thing about latex effects. You really have to to light them carefully to make sure that you are accentuating them in a way that makes them look craggy or wet or whatever and not in a way that makes them look like latex and this is when we see little flashes of it it works but when we see the whole monster it's like it just looks like a big latex effect and and is that stan winston's fault it is not but it it does rob for me some of the pleasure of what i would say is a good monster design no, that's a good point. So, like, uh, he might be doing a good job, but it's not salvaging anything for the movie because the movie is rejecting it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Although so, I do, the, yeah. the the early scene where we see, like, some sort of horrible amalgamation of two human bodies, I guess that's not early, it's about midway through, uh, that is a good effect, and it's used well, I think. Yeah, no, there, there, there are good effects scattered throughout. I would say the one that uh, affects me the most is when they're taking a uh, a skin sample off of someone's neck. That's a really gross and effective mm. moment. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, the the monster itself, I mean it, it's it's low rent the thing and that's just you know, you could just watch the thing. <laughs> like I I mean that's that's kind of for me the problem with this movie in a nutshell is like sure underwater is good, like it adds a nice wrinkle. But but it is so much of it is what if the thing was worse? And my answer to that is, well, if the thing was worse, I would not want to watch it. But I, the thing is good, so why am I not just watching it? Yeah, no that that is the, that is the ultimate philosophical question that kind of plagues Leviathan <laughs> overall. Um, but I would say the, the the one way that Leviathan really justifies its existence is that it adds to the menagerie of uh, spring-loaded jump scare animals. Because um, obviously, and I'm, I'm stealing this phrase from you, there's the spring-loaded cat in all of the uh, slasher movies. And and I, I forget where I stole that phrase from, but it, it was it was a term of art in the, the 2000s. Let's talk about slashers on the internet. Got it. Okay, Internet. it's coming. It it is you know it is it is a cultural moment. This phrase, yes. Um, but yes. So, and then obviously in twenty uh, twelve's uh, Chernobyl Diaries, we had the spring loaded polar bear. Mm. Um, there's also Alien versus Predator has a spring loaded penguin, which I do uh, adore. If I um, recall correctly, doesn't the first Friday the Thirteenth have a spring loaded duck? Uh. That doesn't ring a bell, and I've seen that movie okay. too many times. I feel like in one of the Friday the Thirteenth, she like hears a noise and turns around, and it's a duck. Ooh, I think that's part three. Okay. I, I'll I I'm due for a rewatch on that whole franchise, so I'll I'll, I'll double check. Um, but this one it has a spring loaded anglerfish jump scare, mm-hmm. which I really appreciate a lot. Um, you know, as a as a stupid jump scare historian i think that that's very important <laughs> yes and and i will i will say the anglerfish moment is is dumb as all jump scares in 80s crap horror films tend to be uh but i i will add to my my list of two good things that i think are or two things that are, are somewhat functional here i think the underwater scenes are actually pretty okay uh, there's there's an enforced like murky slowness to them that I think adds to the tension in a way that this film badly needs to be doing anything to add to its tension. Okay, I agree with that, with the exception of the opening scene where uh, De Jesus is losing oxygen and they has to be dragged back into the ship. Um, oh right, 
But I, I just find that scene really inert. But I think it's largely because you can't tell which actor is which because of the suits. And we haven't right. met any of the characters yet. So it's hard to be invested in that scene. Yeah, I actually forgot, even though I just watched it, I forgot that's how the movie opened. Because it's such a it's such a frivolous piece of nothing. And I think it's only there because without that, it would be like half an hour before the first remotely like genre film thing would happen. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, much like a slasher film in that sense. Yeah, and and much like the slasher film, the thing that it decides to fill the early moments with is stupid and doesn't actually service anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will say that the the movie does, like it 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 does not really build tension or horror in any meaningful way or any consistent way. Um, but there are a couple scenes that I I thought were effective. I mean. There's the moment where the uh, the guy who can read Russian, which I think is Richard Krenna's character, Doc. I believe that's I correct. Recall, um, they they find the like basically the black box of the submarine, and they're looking through all the crew files, and each file says deceased. And they're kind of the kind of increasing awareness that something horrible has happened here is really really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think. For about five minutes, it's a reasonably effective disease thriller before it becomes a deeply unaffected monster thriller. I agree with that, actually. I, I think that that is a good way of characterizing the middle part of this film. Um, but yeah, what was there anything just in the story that did work for you? Um, no. It's... <laughs> It, again, it's such a thing clone. And and it raises the question, well, could I not just watch the thing? And then even the parts that are sort of like, okay, there's something there, uh, most of which I would say have to do with, with Meg Foster's character, who's the, um, the like, repulsive corporate Gordon. meanie who, who, like, keeps popping in on video phone to just be horrible and is like orchestrating some sort of God knows what uh, on the crew. Uh, even those moments basically feel like like they were also done better in Alien and Aliens. Yeah, no, she's basically, she's playing like, if if Ripley got to talk to Wayland or Yutani, this is what that scene would be like. Basically. <laughs> um... Yeah, and I mean, you're. I, I do think that the the scenes are kind of empty, but they do they are serviced by Meg Foster performing them because typically, like Meg Foster will hang up the phone and then she'll stare off into space while music plays, and that's how we know she's evil because she's not really actually doing anything. But it's it's a it's a more interesting performance than anybody else. Right, and and that's the thing. It's like it's evil largely because you just get this sense that. She's like cackling to herself internally when she does anything. Uh, it's a it's a a non role. It's basically just the people to like show up on the video phone and and have Weller like grumble and grouse and then they hang up the video phone. Um, but I think that she's just so good at when I think of Meg Foster and this is not true of every one of her performances. I just tend to think of this kind of like loathsome snake-like villain type character and and she's very good at that like she has that sort of energy and it works in this film because it needs a shortcut to get to here is our villain here's our human villain at least yeah and it does deliver it's kind of a very charming stupid ending where uh peter weller gets to punch her in the face it's it's a weird final note for this movie. It's crazy misogynist as a final note for this movie, but oh, yeah. I also I also laugh like a, a hyena when that happens. It's like yeah, it, it's sudden, it's unexpected. It's like it, it's it's such a weirdly blocked moment and it's literally like he punches her crazy loud foley punch and then the credits start rolling and that's like it. Yeah, it, it it is a wild it is a wild swing, but I, I do love an audacious uh, final shot in a film. And also, I mean, the obvious you know, it's just like no no bones about it. It is a misogynistic choice for the film to make. But the way that she has played the character thus far, like it, it is a cartoon character and not a person, so it is That's easier the, it, to swallow. It feels earned. Like we have at no point felt anything kindly towards this character. 
Yeah, and, and it's a much better ending than if it had ended on um, his uh, closing line to the monster, which I believe is, say hi, motherfucker. That tracks, yes. I, I don't recall specifically. By that point, I think my attention was starting to lag pretty bad. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I was pouring through my notes again to refresh my memory on the film, and that's what I wrote down, and I would not have written it down if it wasn't spoken aloud, so I'm pretty sure that's that's what he says, and that's such a terrible line. It's, it, is a, it is a good candidate, or is a good addition to the, the Hall of Fame of lines that want to be smile, you son of a bitch, and aren't. Yeah, I just, I I actually, one of my pet peeves with the kind of cinema community as a whole is the ability for many, uh, like, bad movie enthusiasts to really embrace any line that has the word motherfucker at the end of it, um, <laughs> because it really encourages laziness in screenwriters. Um, or like um, in uh, uh, Leprechaun, the, uh, the kill line is, fuck you, Lucky Charms, which is maybe the worst written line ever, but people quote it all the time. <laughs> I am glad that I don't interact with the kind of people who quote that line all the time. That sounds tiresome. It, it, it really is, Tim. I'm not saying I'm not saying these are my friends, but I've been around them. They are they are part of your social circle in some capacity. Yeah, it's exhausting. That is that is both one of the worst lines ever written, and not necessarily one of the worst lines in any given Leprechaun film. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, there, there's a weird kind of dimensional rift when you enter the Leprechaun films in terms of quality. Oh God. But, but we are not here to talk about the Leprechaun films, although, though I, I frankly wish we were because they Uh, are, they are feisty and Leviathan I think is, it's just such a knockoff, you know, like. Oh yeah. This is what makes it hard for me to talk about because it's like once you've done it's the thing plus alien worth a worst cast, like that's all it is. There's just there's no meat on these bones. Yeah, I mean I I, I, I too would much rather talk about an underwater leprechaun movie called Lepriacon, but mm-hmm. it doesn't exist yet. I mean we have Leprechaun in space and that turned out well, so surely Leprechaun oh, Underwater God. would be would be in that vicinity. Yeah. I, see, and again, speaking of the dimensional rift in quality in the uh, Leprechaun films, Leprechaun 4 in space um, is potentially the worst movie ever made. Um, it is potentially the worst movie ever made. That's not even an exaggeration. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Um, but also the evil Nazi space scientist spider robot man, it, uh, Dr. Mittenhand, is one of the best characters in Western literature. So it's kind of a weird dichotomy. It's it's like it's both one of the worst movies ever made and also a movie that I love to think about and love to talk about because it's it's a hoot. Yeah, it, it's it is it is a movie that is better served by watching clips from it on YouTube than watching the film, though, I would say. I would say that is certainly true. Like, just point to any moment, like, the leprechaun bursts out of an astronaut's dick. Great. Wonderful. A+. Plus. But yes. the movie is just so excruciatingly boring to watch. No, it, 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 it is. You are certainly not lying about that. Anyway, sorry. Leviathan. We're talking about Leviathan. Um... I have one nice thing to say about Leviathan. Um, I think that there is a shot that is visually telling a story. <laughs> Isn't that nice? You think there's um, a shot doing that? That's very exciting. Which shot do you think is doing that? The shot that I think is doing that is when um, basically Six Pack has secreted a flask that he has found full of vodka from the Russian submarine. And that is where the kind of disease monster germ- germinates. Mm-hmm. Um and we kind of get a sense that this is going on, though we don't know exactly what's going to happen because of it. Um, and Lisa Eilbacher comes up to him and she's asking for a, uh, a sip of vodka because she's like, vodka's my favorite. I like you now, even though I've hated you for about 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's handing her the vodka in a flask and you can see her face reflected in the tipping flask. And it's a really good ominous shot that, real that that it's just really cool and it reminds you that something horrible is going to happen because of this vodka sure um but that's the one shot that i remember or care about i mean anytime that that directors and cinematographers get to do reflection shots they uh 
they like to do it. It's a fancy thing to do. So they, they tend to stand out in a good way. Yeah, cough, cough, last night in Soho. Hey. Except that's not that's not finding a way to do a fancy thing in one shot. That's like building your movie around the opportunity to let you do that fancy thing. No, I know. Same as uh, Poltergeist 3 did that, too. Um, you know, that's cool. I, um, I I have not had the pleasure of Poltergeist 3. Oh, I really like Poltergeist 3. <laughs> Um, I actually find it an improvement on part two, which is just really kind of wan. And I was going to say, being an improvement on part two is not necessarily a compliment, but I, I, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Um, anyway, you know, any excuse to talk about anything that's not Leviathan. Yeah, we are we are doing a phenomenal job of, of drifting in this episode, which I, I think speaks to the movie and, and our relative. And what's what's interesting to me, like we're talking about it as though it is just this steaming stack sack of shit we both gave this movie two and a half stars well see that's the thing that is that's the type of movie that's hardest to talk about and easiest to be upset with because it's <laughs> giving you nothing it, it's not giving you good or bad it just flatly exists right right and i i think both you and i would appreciate a colossal misfire over a uh bland rote run through of kind of genre tropes exactly and and it's it gets back to the you know this is this is just such a clearly you can tell exactly what the note was it was like okay the abyss is coming out let's do an underwater movie what do we know about james cameron we know aliens so let's do underwater aliens <clears throat> it's basically what this is and and it's just so like the, the pieces that have been like plucked to assemble this again, it's the thing in Alien Have a Baby. It's it's a competent version of that. Like it's soulless and it's uninspired, but it's not like ineptly made. It doesn't have the inspiration to be ineptly made. Again, the only thing I can point to that's like actively just wrong is that the uh the monsters overlit. Yeah, no, yeah, that's the only, like, flaw in this movie, other than, I suppose, the acting, which I find uh, unimpressive across the board, as we've talked and, about. But it, and it being is boring is a flaw. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's not egregious. It just, it's just, it's just a movie. It's just a movie. Um, I would say an, one of the weaker links is the screenplay, which has such bon mots as a uh, uh, go suck on a shrimp. It does. It does indeed. Oh, and then also uh, a, the Daniel. No, no, no. Uh, Peter Weller issues this threat to Six Pack. He's like, "I'm gonna pop your tops, all six of them." <laughs> Once you've given a character such a, a wonderfully evocative nickname as Six Pack, how do you not? How do you not make use of that in your wordplay? Yeah, but I just, I mean, look, I, 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 I think above all else, I am a pun critic and a pop your tops is not a good, like you, you have to force that in order to set up the bad pun that follows. Like, cause that's not a phrase that you say mm -hmm. anyway. Sorry. It's just, it's exhausting. Say hi, motherfucker. We did it. <laughs> yes. Is there anything I got, else I got to nothing talk else about? to add. I got nothing else to add. Yeah, I think this is it. I think that's Leviathan. <laughs> um Okay, well I mean, we don't have a time limit for these episodes, and I, I think ultimately having a shorter episode is good. First of all, it'll help me rest my voice, and we do have a uh another episode coming out fairly quickly after this. Um I don't know exactly when it's gonna come out because I'm trying to get these turned around as quickly as possible and not on the uh schedule that we had to adjust. Um but we're looking to get the second episode this month out, you know, before the end of the month. Um Ideally. Yeah, that's that's the goal. And also um for, for that episode, because this uh this Patreon request was the final request from our first round where we were just doing one movie per request. So we have an open slot next week, and what we're going to be talking about is Wes Craven's 1991 classic, The People Under the Stairs, because that came out in November 91, so it's its 30th anniversary this month. Very auspicious number. And that is a film you have never seen before, am I correct, Tim? I have not seen that film. I, I'm so deeply excited to be discussing that film with Tim. I think it'll be a much more... Uh, 
a potent discussion than what Leviathan could bring. It it will be curious to see where it goes because if nothing else, I know that you are much more pro West Craven than I am. That is very true. But even if you dislike the movie, there is plenty to talk about. That will be exciting. Yeah, so I'm excited to talk about that. Um, like I said, I, I'm I'm not going to promise exactly when it's coming out, but the hope is that it'll be out before November 30th, like by mm, let's say December 2nd at the absolute latest. <laughs> Let's let's um, say let's say by the end of the first week in December. Let's not let's start pin ourselves down. Okay, yeah, let's not do that. Um, but yes, uh, theoretically, we'll be back to our normal schedule of the second and fourth Friday for December. But it is also the holiday season, so you know what? Fuck it. It's we're coming out when we're coming out. You're gonna get two more in December. Especially because I believe the fourth Friday might be Christmas Eve, and that feels like an incongruous day to release a horror podcast. Mm, I disagree. Um, okay. But yeah, we'll 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 figure it out. Um, that might come early, that might come late. Who knows? But yeah, we'll see you as soon as humanly possible for the people under the stairs. And I, I can't wait for what we've got coming up. It's going to be a very exciting uh, couple months over at Bride of Alternate Ending. Thank you so much for listening. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ah! She hates me.